Hi folks, today I have pretty much a really, really great honor. I'm gonna introduce you to Justin Bean, uh, the owner of Scotia Private, Private Game Reserve, is that right? That's right, yeah, Private Game Reserve, yeah. Okay, great, so, so I've known Justin for about two, three years maybe. We met at another event and we've always kept in touch and I've been super excited now that things are lightening up, that we've been able to come as a family to come up and um, come and view this amazing reserve and I, I just wanted to ask Justin a few questions to share with you so that you can see what we're experiencing here and now and I think one of the things Justin can you just share a brief history of how it started when it started um, uh, and then just some of the history around um, the, the research and development I think folks this is so important to understand the conservation of what we're doing and why I, I really applaud Justin and his team of of making it work the way that it has. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, thanks very much for Anton to come visit us at Scotia and, and do a bit of camping and all that. That's fantastic. Couldn't wait. <laughs> it's nice to get support from the South African people, especially now that we've lost the foreign market. Correct, um, correct. That's actually something that we're looking into now, but I'll, I'll divulge a bit more on that just now. But cool. yeah, just to speak about the history and the heritage here at Scotia. Um, I am the sixth generation bean on the property, so it's been in our family since 1830. Wow. Yeah, so wow. It's, uh, Actually, yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and originally from England, and that was the second wave of settlers. The family came out and settled on this piece of land just outside of Port Elizabeth, Algoa Bay, as it was known back then. Okay. And it has always been a farm and a subsistence farm where the family needed to stay alive for a very long period, and then slowly went into commercial cattle farming. Okay. And my grandfather was one of the big pioneers of dairy farming in the area and had quite a large herd of dairy cattle or dairy cows. And I mean, back in those days when my dad was still a little kid, the milk was taken down in, you know, a little milk uh, can yes, and left, right. left for a truck to come and pick up under a big olive tree, a wild okay. olive tree. So it's interesting to see how times have changed. And it then progressed to a dairy and a, and a more modern system. And my dad would sit in the dairy and he would document the milk figures that would come in during each milking period. But during that he would sit out and actually look towards this hill behind us here and he would dream of, of Eland running across that hill yeah. and, and other game. And that's when he set all of his plans in motion. And this is way, this is before I was even born, so this is in the early 80s. Okay. And um, yeah, so he, he started doing a little bit of research as to where to find wildlife and chatting to a few of the other farms in the area who already had wildlife and, and decided to, to start getting some blessed buck and impala and springbuck and that some of the of basics back, back into the area yeah and uh, my grandfather then told him he's wasting his time with buck yeah and stick to dairy farming and all yeah, that yeah, yeah. <laughs> guaranteed money yeah exactly so my father <laughs> said okay well dad let's let's have a little compo yeah and uh, he decided to challenge him for a monthly income and my dad went to town. He drew up a little brochure, a hand-drawn brochure. He got onto our Go FM news and, and well, Go FM and did a bit of an advert in that yeah. on the radio in Port Elizabeth. He had an old Toyota Hilux and he welded up some seats and put that on the back and that was his first game viewer. And back then the popular thing was to do a night safari. So okay. it was only a night drive. You'd arrive and do a dinner and then go on a night safari because you'd see all the nocturnal species and some of the diurnal species. Anyway, that month he, he doubled what my grandfather made with the dairy. Wow. And my grandfather got a bit of a shock and yeah, yeah. didn't realize there was actually a bit of scope for ecotourism in our area. Okay. And yeah, he said, okay, well, carry on with the, the, the game farming and I'll carry on with the cattle farming and we'll see how it works for a bit. And my grandfather gradually saw it improve and, and just the, the tourists started flowing into the area. At yeah. that stage, were they local or foreign tourists coming and going? Local, a very small handful of foreigners that were starting to visit South Africa. Look, there were still the all the reserves up in, that bordered Kruger. Okay. Um, okay. That were doing safaris for a very long period. All right, and that would be a lot more well known amongst the foreigners than this little place in uh, exactly. in PE. Okay. Ado Elephant Park was well known. Okay. And you know the world knows about Ado Elephant Park, and even back then. But there were no private reserves around the park doing guided drives. Okay. And you, you could back then only drive around in your own car in the park. There was no guided drives in the park either. Yeah. And that's where my dad looked up north. He looked to those reserves at Kruger and said, well, why can't we do that here? Have guided safaris. That's and, right. And that's when it all started. 
And five years later, there was a flurry of reserves popping up, and I think now there's over 30 reserves in, our, in a radius of 100 kilometers around us. Wow, okay. So it, it really it's pretty took busy. Off. Yeah. It is pretty busy, okay. And, and I don't know if you can see, folks, at the moment, but there's actually some giraffe uh, grazing down behind us. And I learned something new from Justin, who, as you heard, has been here forever, <laughs> um, is that giraffes actually have a way of cu communication. And I think that was something that you shared with us on a, on a drive where you said that these folks came out from, uh, where were they from? They were from Vienna University. Yeah. From Vienna, and they did research and realized that giraffes can actually communicate. Um, what other type of um, research and development that has been done on the farm that has been quite Im impactful? So, something that's quite big that we're also pioneers of, uh, look, I wouldn't say we're pioneers of it outright, but in our area, yeah. um, was, was the protection of some of our old trees by using bees. Okay. So we've always been beekeepers as a family. My great-grandfather, grandfather, my dad, and now my sister are looking after the bees at Scotia. And we have about 85 beehives, and we've placed them around, strategically around these beautiful old Scotia trees, especially okay. the Scotia trees, some of which are 300 years old. And we knew in 2012, when we were introducing elephants, that these trees would be broken down perhaps not killed mm. but broken down and destroyed so we wanted to protect some of them and we we went about putting up a bunch of beehives around these trees and we've learned a lot we've learned that the more beehives you have the better the less space the elephant have to move around the better um, it also is a lot more effective when the bees are more active meaning yeah. when the when it's warmer in summer on a hot summer's night it's more effective okay a cold winter's night is not that effective so that's one of the projects where we've we've done or we've learned a lot, put it that way. Um, but we've we've done a lot of chatting to to other scientists in that field, and and realised that we weren't the first. And okay. throughout Africa, it's been used to try and keep elephants out of subsistence farmland. The one you told me about the other day was also about um, the anthill. Uh, termite mount. The termite mount. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was amazing. I mean, uh, folks, three thousand years of termite mounts. I mean, just let that sink in. Three thousand years. That's pre. Uh, that's pre-Jesus. That's pretty hectic, eh? So it's, it's incredible. We had a professor from the Rhodes University that studied these termites, the harvested termites of this area. And he, he had looked on maps, Google Maps or imagery, and realized that there were some mounds that looked very old. And he came out here, and it's an area known as the Quachas Flakta, where the Quacha used to roam. Okay. And the oldest one you could find was 3,000 years old. Yeah, it's, it's remarkable. That's pretty hectic. <laughs> anyway, listen, so give a brief overview. Obviously, folks, we can't share all the animals that are here. It's, it's, it's still a private game reserve. But I do implore you, follow the links below. Follow Justin in Goonie Defender. That's, yes, that's yeah. this little bad boy over here um, on social media. Come and visit. Uh, reach out to them. Justin's very good with communication back pretty quickly. So share just a bunch of the top I wouldn't say top, maybe you know, 50% of the animals that you have here uh, that people can, can experience. So what really put us on the map were the lions. We were amongst the first to have free roaming lions in the Cape province. Okay. Um, and then elephant, buffalo, they're also part of the big five at Scotia, and giraffe as we've seen behind us, hippo, a large variety of antelope species as well. It is large. Um, and a large number of species as well. So, yeah. Zebra, eland, kudu, wildebeest, hartebeest. Uh, both hyenas or just one? Brown hyena. Only the brown yeah. hy hyena. I saw my first one the other day and I was so stoked. I've never seen a brown hy um, hy hy hyena. You've got two crocs. There's crocodiles, yeah. There's uh, crocodiles two crocs water. that are chilling with a hippo. Um, Justin, thank you very much, man. I, I'm really, I, I'm really stoked I got to experience this. You know, my family have had so much fun, and um, I really wish you only the best in this amazement. And folks, please come along, share, share it with your friends. Come in, come and see what they're doing here. It's not only just a great day drive. Uh, you can stay here. They've got shadows. How many shadows do you have? You said you've got. Uh, some lodges down here right and then you've yes. got the tent camps that's right so we can accommodate about 20 people in various accommodations there's in total in total okay. there's, there's three lodges and the lodges take eight and the tented camp take takes eight okay and then we have some rooms and and then of course there's 
camping which we're branching into now as well correct correct so i'm going to share some footage of uh, one of the tented camps they're amazing they fenced off with a lot of the thorn bush um i'll roll that in the in the clips uh, during the video just so that you can you, you, you can check it out but follow the links the website and uh, they're always available to accommodate good honest people not the bad ones <laughs> thank you justin i appreciate it